and welcome. This is the 23rd of November 2012 and to another edition of the Health Research Report. Well, to start out with, let's look at psychosis or psychotic symptoms, so to say. If I'm getting the right light here. Yeah, this is good. All right. What they're talking about primarily is basically developing psychotic symptoms in regards or in conjunction with use of social networking sites. I be, for example, Facebook. Now they took, or they basically not they, these Tao researchers, and they published this article in the Israel, the Israel Journal of Psychiatry and Related Sciences. So that you could use your footnote. They took individuals with no prior history of psychosis, drug use, you name it. Now they happen to be a little bit lonely, henceforth the use of social networking sites. And they looked at this and they saw the gradual development in these individuals of exacerbation of psychotic symptoms, including delusions, anxiety, confusion, and intensified use of computer communications, meaning the more delusional they became, the more they liked to use the computer. Now, in these cases, they took individuals which happened to be a little bit socially isolated or a little lonely before they started, uh, how would you say, utilizing these social networking sites to find companionship. All right, the good news is, before I go on, is all the individuals which developed psychosis in regards to these social networking sites recovered with proper treatment. Sounds still kind of creepy. All right, and this is what it did. They found that the patients who saw refuge from a lonely situation and found solace in intense virtual relationships. Although these relationships were positive at first, obviously, kind of like a social form of trolling, they eventually led their feelings of hurt, like being unfriended, uh, betrayal, and invasion of privacy. Of course, once someone knows something private about you, they can't wait to spread it around the entire internet. Henceforth, these people are the most experienced with computers. That basically, patients began to feel vulnerable as a result of sharing private information. And even one experience in their terms, what began to develop tactile hallucinations, believing the person beyond the screen was physically touching her. Yeah, that's really creepy. Some of the problematic features of the internet related issues of geographical and spatial distortion with individuals, the absence of nonverbal cues, like you can't tell if a person's angry or not. This happens often with text messaging, henceforth smiley faces have to be raining down from the sky. Uh, tendency, tendency to idolize the person with whom someone is communicating, becoming intimate without ever meeting face to face. Yeah, that's cool. And all these factors which can contribute to a patient's break with reality and the development of uh, what's called the psychotic state. And it's interesting too, because now the researchers say when you ask a person how their social life is, in their words, you have to ask about the Facebook and social networking habits, because that's now included in how a person's social life is. And the Tao of Research has brought this up primarily because psychiatrists and psychologists now have to look at their computer or networking relationships as much as they are actually looking at their you know, real relationships, so sure say, because these virtual relationships in their world really is a real relationship. Something to think about. All right, now more to the health issues, not mental health, but physical health, and it comes down to sweat glands. This is an interesting article. This is printed in the American Journal of Pathology. See, one thing I never realized myself is these glands that may not pronounce it properly, so I'm going to spell it, E-C-C-R-I-N-E, -E, sweat glands. Ecrin sweat glands, I believe. I know someone's probably going to correct me. But these sweat glands are unique to only one mammal, which makes me kind of weird because I don't know how evolutionary it could have evolved. The genetic defect, DNA, RNA, you know, who knows. But what ends up happening is these sweat glands are only known to humans. And the reason they're important is because these sweat glands also produce stem cells responsible for healing. And they said this, the human skin is rich with millions of sweat glands that help your body, Ecrin sweat glands, that help your body cool down after a trip or gym on a warm day. These same glands, the University of Michigan Health System researcher shows, also have to play a key role in providing cells recovery for skin wounds, such as scrapes, burns, and ulcers. And they said these human eucrine sweat glands also store an important reservoir, 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 of adult stem cells that can be quickly recruited to aid in wound healing. But there's good reason why these 
sweat glands are not studied well. And again, in their words, these ECRIN, E-C-C-R-I-N-E, -C -C -E, sweat glands are unique to humans and absent in the body skin of laboratory animals. Henceforth, they can't study them so far, unless you want to start burning and scraping and cutting people, which I'm sure someone's going to do. It says, we have discovered that humans heal their skin in a very unique way, different from other animals. These regenerative potential of sweat glands has been one of our body's best kept secrets. Obviously not sharing with the other mammals on the planet and whoever we else we may have evolved from. Our findings certainly advance our understanding of the normal healing process and will hopefully pave the way for designing better target therapies. So sweat glands are important. So when it comes to healing, circulation of the skin is real important. And again, with all sorts of things on those lines, sweating, one of the best things you can do to activate those felt stem cells, which are hiding if you actually do sweat. All right. Now another one, controversial. So I'm going to do a lot of quoting because I don't want to get in trouble. I'm just reading it. That's it. All right. Trial results do not support the use of general health checks warrant experts. What does that mean? Getting a health checkup is not going to do anything for you. In their words, I'll go back to reading it. Checks have not reduced the number of deaths from cardiovascular disease or cancer. This was done by the Cochrane Systematic Review. Obviously, it was a review of another study from the British Medical Journal that was released in October, which obviously didn't make any TV news. All right. Researchers found that routine general health checks, which become common practice in some countries, do not reduce the number of deaths from cardiovascular disease or cancer or really anything else. They do, however, they do, however, increase the number of new diagnoses. So, all right, so now you know what's wrong with you, but knowing what's wrong with you is really not going to do anything to help you. All right, health checks were introduced to the attention of reducing morbidity. Also, big moneymaker. And prolonging life, and there are many potential benefits, including detection of both increased risk factors and precursor disease, high blood pressure, hypertension, cholesterol, so on and so forth. Thus preventing cancer from developing, counseling on diet, weight and smoking, reassuring healthy people, thus reduce worry about potential for disease. All right. However, screening healthy people, I'm quoting, screening healthy people can be harmful and can lead to overdiagnosis and overtreatment, a topic which was featured in the British Medical Journal back in October. The researchers also point out that invasive diagnostic tests may cause harm. Hmm. Prostate screening, mammograms, uh, an overly zealous doctor, you name it. The researchers have also pointed that out. Being labeled as having a disease may also negatively impact a healthy person's view of themselves. When's the last time you went to your doctor's office and your doctor asked you how you're feeling? Think about that. Your chart may look good, but no one really cares how you're feeling anymore because there's a drug for that. All right. And maybe many people's views and their health behavior. Few of the individual tests used in health checks uh, have been adequately studied and trials has not clear whether they do more harm than good. Hmm, interesting. Again, that's why I'm reading it. So the Cochrane researchers looked at basically 14 trials, and they reviewed over 182,880 participants, which really is a good-sized number considering most of your trials don't only really involve more than a handful. All right, 11,940, who unfortunately did not make it through the trial due to death. 76,403 were invited to health checks, and the remainder were not. So, 74,000 were getting a regular checkup, actually close to 75,000. The remainder, obviously, were on their own, doing their own thing, spending time watching TV or playing sports or having fun. All participants were over the age of 18, and the study excluded trials specifically targeting older people because they probably wouldn't make it to the end of the trial. And so that only enrolled people over the age of 65. So, all right. Despite some variation regarding the risk of death from cardiovascular disease and cancer, no evidence was found for reduction of either mortality, cardiovascular mortality, or cancer mortality. Unsurprisingly, the researchers found the health checks led to more diagnosis and medical treatment for hypertension, although this was unfrequently studied. 
So the lack of beneficial effects indicates that the interventions did not work as intended in the included trials. Health checks are likely to decrease the number of diagnoses, but in the absence of benefits, this study suggests overdiagnosis and overtreatment. Remember, science is about research and things. It doesn't have to come to a comfortable conclusion. They said, and to keep on going, in an accompanying editorial by Professor uh, Macaulay, the primary care editor at the British Medical Journal, agrees that although health checks are what they call seductive and seem sensible, and they do, honestly they do, the more you get checked, the more you diagnose, less you bring your car to an auto mechanic, the more likely, you know, you expect your longer you expect your car to be running. But in this case, something's off. Even though they seem sensible, there's little evidence to show that they reduce morbidity and mortality, as well as questioning whether they do more harm than good. Dr. McCauley says that Crossbell and colleagues studies find that irregular health checks are ineffective and show evidence of little effect, and that as the policy should be based upon well-being rather than well-meant good intentions. Really good study. Again, it's looking at the whole part, whether they're uncomfortable or not. And in this case, health checks do make sense, provided it's being done for the right reason altogether. Well, that's it. It's the 23rd November, 2012. I hope I've been some use to you today, and I will catch you guys again, hopefully in about a week or so.